Insights and Best Practice Network webinar about corporate nonprofit partnerships. My name is Shari Ilson and I'm joined by Lauren Wagner and we are thrilled to have you on the call today. Uh, today's session is incredibly exciting because it is a joint session between two webinar series that we do here at Volunteer Match, one for nonprofits and one for uh, socially responsible businesses. And today we're going to be coming together to talk about partnerships. A few logistics. Um, we will be recording this entire thing and posting it on YouTube afterwards. And we will be posting the slides on SlideShare, so no worries there. We're going to send out a follow-up email to you with these links as well as some additional resources for you to learn more. This email, however, may come in a week or so. So um, we promise you will get it, but it may take a little time. In the meantime, you can browse Volunteer Match's YouTube channel and our SlideShare account. If you have questions during the session, please input it into that same chat box where you, we did our audio check, uh, and we will be answering questions for the speakers at the end of the session. You can also join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag VMLearn and VMBPN, uh, and we'll be sending out notes about those hashtags as well for you. So let's get started. As I mentioned, this is a very special session about corporate nonprofit partnerships, and there's another reason it's special. It's also part two. We did an original session about corporate nonprofit partnerships late last year, and it was so popular, and there was so much to talk about, we decided we had to do another one. So the three speakers are back. We're going to dive in deeper into these topics, and hopefully you'll walk away with some really concrete, well-fleshed out strategies that you can try to build and deepen your corporate nonprofit partnership. I am going to now um, just uh, introduce your speakers. So our first speaker is Mazarine Trace. She is the author of The Wild Woman's Guide to Fundraising, which has been called one of the top 10 books of 2010 by Beth Cantor, which is no small thing, as some of you may know. Um, Mazarin's second book is The Wild Woman's Guide to Social Media, published in 2012, which was given a five-star rating by Joanne Fritz, who's the editor of nonprofit.about.com. And her latest book, Get the Job, Your Fundraising Career Empowerment Guide, was published in April of 2013. Mazarin has raised over a million dollars for small, national, and international nonprofit organizations via grants, events, appeals, and more. We're very excited to have Mazarin on the webinar with us today. Desiree uh, has over 20 years experience creating, leading, and managing international multicultural teams through major organizational, organizational changes in over 40 countries. Her deep level of expertise in fundraising, grant management, and environmental, so social justice, and faith-based initiatives allows her to offer specific insights that help organizations achieve consistent, quality program results at the chapter, national, and international level. So she's really a very holistic expert. Amanda has a deep passion for connecting people with opportunities to use their talent to make an impact. As a manager at the Charles Schwab Foundation, Amanda leads the employee volunteer strategy and is responsible for engaging Schwab's 13,000 employees in service. Wow. Amanda has nearly a decade of experience in volunteerism, philanthropy, and nonprofit management. Her background includes managing nonprofit fundraising campaigns totaling $10 million, leading community development programs in Ecuador, and competing as a varsity track athlete at Georgetown University. So multi-talented ladies on the call today, and welcome everyone. All right, before we launch into the meat of today's session, we thought it would be a good idea to give you a short recap of um, what we did in part one, and then we'll go into some topics about expanding engagement beyond events and out-of-the-box program elements. So that's our agenda for today. And um, the recap. So last September, uh, when we had the part one of this session, we really started with the basics. How do you identify good partners, uh, whether you're a corporation looking to partner with a nonprofit or a nonprofit looking to partner with a business? 
how do you identify the right partner for you, and then how do you reach out and establish that relationship and make sure that it's strong. And after we talked about that, we went into the topics of pro bono and skilled volunteering and the best way to incorporate that into an established partnership from both sides of the aisle. And our three speakers really came at these topics from three different perspectives. So Mazarin talked about small nonprofits. Uh, Desiree um, shared perspective from working with large organizations. And Amanda uh, uh, held the corporate perspective for us. Today we're going to do things a little differently. We're going to really dive deep into these topics. Uh, and the speakers are going to share their firsthand experiences tips and tricks, and we're really going to have more of a discussion. Um, and hopefully we will get to all the content this time, as well as your questions, and it will be extremely valuable. So now that I've talked for a while, let's get to the people that you really want to hear from. I'm going to um, turn things over to Amanda, and she's going to start by talking about getting employees involved beyond events. So Amanda, um, welcome. Thank you, Shari, and thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be back with you all again. And just to share a little bit about the Charles Schwab Foundation, we really feel it's our privilege and responsibility to help individuals and families achieve financial well-being. And we do that through three pillars, so education, advocacy, and volunteerism. Today, I just wanted to highlight a few of our volunteer efforts and talk about how we've really moved from an event-based effort into seeing deeper um, and ongoing engagement from our employees with nonprofits. So hopefully this will be helpful to you all. Next slide. To set the context, we usually see um, a large number of employees involved in um, turnkey events. So one example, we have Schwab Volunteer Week every year that we lead. And this year, nearly 4,000 employees were out volunteering in the community. Many of them were doing hands-on projects, working in soup kitchens. Um, you know, they were doing a, a one-time opportunity. But as these employees get exposed to the missions of organizations, um, as they see kind of where they fit and can help out, we've been so pleased to see that lead to deeper engagement where they've gotten involved in um, pro bono work or they've even joined the board of organizations. So on the corporate end at Schwab, we support and encourage employees to do this and to move kind of down this spectrum of deeper engagement. But ultimately, many of them kind of wait to be asked by the nonprofit. So for those of you who are nonprofits on the phone, um, when you are engaging um, corporate employees in a, an event um, or a, a, you know, a one-time volunteer opportunity, I just really encourage you to make your needs known and to make the ask and do the follow-up in terms of continued engagement. Often that's the only thing waiting or the only step missing in terms of um, our employees taking that next step. Um, so now I just wanted to highlight two quick examples um, to illustrate this a little bit more. Next slide. Um, this May, we featured two skills marathons. Um, and this was new for us, but it was really exciting to see how um, about 100 of our employees came together and volunteered with 20 nonprofits on consulting projects, where just in one day they aimed to complete a consulting engagement and help um, the organization build its capacity in marketing or strategy or finance or technology or HR. Um, it was really successful, but again, it was only one day. So when we think about how to expand engagement beyond this one day, one of the things we did was just follow up and see you know, what percent of our teams stayed engaged. And we encouraged them to stay engaged, but we actually didn't provide that next step for them. Um, and we were so pleased to see that 50% of the teams organically on their own followed up, stayed involved, and are continuing the relationship with the organization they consulted with. Um, many of them are continuing a, a consulting project. Some of them have stayed engaged as an advisor for the organization. And um, we have even more that are interested. So we found that two-thirds of our employees we're interested in continuing and staying involved in longer term or engagements with these nonprofits, even though all they signed up for that day was that one day event. Um, so there's an even greater opportunity there. And again, many of them are just waiting to hear from the organization that um, you know, there is a next step for them and that, that the nonprofit has another need for them. And one of our employee teams, just to share a, a little story, worked with a nonprofit who was looking to launch a new service in the Bay Area. 
And while they worked on kind of mapping out how to create that launch plan, they realized that the organization also had a, a challenge with their branding. So their actual um, uh, program they were going to launch was not completely set apart or distinguished enough um, in terms of its own brand from what they were already doing. And our top um, branding executive, who was a part of that consulting team, is now um, gathering a team to put together a two-day branding workshop for that nonprofit. Um, and you know that's just a follow-up that he's offered to do with his team. And again, an example of how um, you know one engagement can lead to something that um, really expands organically. On the next slide, I'll share just another example which includes one of Schwab's signature partners, the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. We co-developed a financial education curriculum and program with Boys and Girls Club called Money Matters. And we engage our employees and branch managers to um, help deliver the curriculum and to also celebrate the scholarship winners from these programs. So our branch managers will often host a scholarship winner at their offices. And we found that this one leader getting involved really can create a multiplier effect in terms of both the number of other employees involved and then the depth of that engagement and relationship moving forward. So we had one branch manager here in San Francisco who got his whole branch involved in regularly volunteering um, at their local club, teaching financial education classes. And um, in addition, one of his financial consultants ended up joining the board of a local club. Um, and this is all just a result of um, what naturally followed after you know presenting a um, scholarship check and celebrating one club kid at our offices. So um, I think it's a great example of many of the stories that we've heard. Um, and the theme really is you know having a, a leader involved who um, is passionate about um, an organization and sees the need and is asked to do something as a next step. It really can create, um, you know, open the floodgates in terms of getting others involved and also um, creating that deeper relationship and, and partnership. So, you know, this this um, branch really feels like they've adopted this local club as their club, and so they've engaged in a multitude of ways. And I think it all stemmed just from that that one event and opportunity and getting the right leader involved. So I just wanted to share those couple examples as really simple ways that, you know, while Schwab. Um, foundation may have facilitated an initial event or introduction, we really saw the, um, the, the nonprofit and then the employee take the lead in terms of the next step um, for getting engaged and expanding that engagement beyond that one connection. Wow, thank you for sharing that uh, with us, Amanda. I think um, we were watching, Lauren and I were watching the Twitter stream and there were so many people that really connected with what you were saying. So many little strategies that other companies and organizations can take with them to deepen a level of engagement beyond events. Um, and it's really cool to hear how a big established company like Schwab was able to approach it sometimes at a rather organic level, um, creating more grassroots growth and engagement, which is very cool. Um, so now, I think we're going to have, um, and again, if you have questions for Amanda, please input them into the chat window or on Twitter, um, and we will uh, address them at the end. Um, for now, we're going to move on to Madrin, who's going to talk about uh, virtual volunteering, I believe she's starting out with first. So go ahead, Madrin. Hey, thanks so much. Um, I'm really, really excited to be here today and uh, to listen to what Amanda is teaching and Desiree also. And um, thanks, everybody, for joining us for this second session. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, um, Sherry, did you do the yeah, next slide? Sorry, it looks like things are out of order. Oh, it's OK. No, this is perfect. This is exactly right. This is perfect. Okay, good. Okay, so um, today I'm coming from the small nonprofit perspective again, and so for those corporations on the line, just bear with me. Um, and uh, I just want to say to everybody on the line today, uh, if you hear something that you'd like to 
correct or add to what we're saying. If you'd like to give some tips and tricks to small nonprofits for working with you, and small nonprofits, if you've got stuff that you have found works really well with virtual volunteering or corporate volunteering, I'd encourage you to add it to the chat window so that we can all learn from you uh, when this webinar is over today. So thanks for sharing your voice and your experience with us, too. Uh, some of these may already know about some sources of online volunteers. Just in case you don't, volunteermatch.org, in my opinion, is the absolute best. Uh, and then uh, idealist.org is another good one. And then uh, UCF Create the Good there twice. That was an accident. Um, but createthegood.org is a project with the AARP. Globalgiving.org is interesting. They um, say that they connect you with corporations. And uh, it seems like what they do is they have a lot of uh, gift card sort of things for employees to do. I'm not really sure how that works. Um, but it's worth checking out is to start building some relationships with uh, corporate volunteers if you don't have any right now. And then I have uh, an, a coaching client who has used grassroots.org to great effect also for um, online volunteers to help her create her annual report. And um, online volunteers can do a number of things for you. And uh, we'll be talking later about some resources about how you can best take advantage of them. In, if you're not in the US, you might want to try out codonation.org, or if you're in the UK, you might want to try helpfromhome.org. Those are other virtual volunteering sites that you can use to find virtual volunteers. One of my uh, virtual volunteering heroines, uh, Jane Cravens, has actually done a webinar for Idealist.org already. Uh, she says that every volunteer can be a virtual volunteer, so you don't necessarily have to have that separation, though it's um, some nonprofits who are totally virtual, they, they do like it. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? Excellent. So how do you create a compelling online volunteer job description that gets results? Well, you'd want to um, segment your target audience by skill. So for example, maybe you want print design. Maybe you want web design. Maybe you want contract law. Maybe you want someone to look over the contracts for your nonprofit or look over legal agreements for you. Maybe you want accounting skills or communication specialists. Or maybe even you want community moderators. Let's say that you have a really big uh, community website and you want people to start uh, engaging. And you have some really strong engagement already with a couple of people. They can help manage this if, if that's something that they're interested in. So um, I really love what Amanda said about having a doorway for uh, corporate volunteers to come in and then creating longer term engagement. And one of the things that is key for virtual volunteers is to constantly be communicating with them in, in every possible way that you can. I know it's really hard for a one person shop or a small nonprofit to do this, um, but if you, if you don't nurture the virtual volunteers, they're not going to come back and they're not going to be the results that you want. So that's really important. You don't always have to be on, but getting back to someone within 24 hours is important. Uh, and I love how Amanda also said that um, they, two thirds of the people on their uh, Schwab's uh, for, like volunteering days wanted to do more with the nonprofits that they volunteered with. So before you begin your virtual volunteering program or you know, your corporate volunteering initiative, you want to make sure that you have automatic emails sent up to remind people, like sorry, set up to remind people that this is something that you're interested in engaging with them long term and giving them other ideas of things to do with you and plugging them into places so that they don't sort of just drift away or feel left out. Oh, next slide, please. Excellent. So um, you can also segment your target audience by time commitment. And Create the Good does this really, really well. They have five minute opportunities, half a day opportunities, and two month opportunities, just for example. So you might want to ask yourself, well, geez, if it's so much work to get a virtual volunteer in the first place, why would I want to post a five-minute opportunity or a half-day opportunity? Well, as Jane Craven says, uh, this is about creating relationships for your nonprofit. That's the only thing. It, it's really nice that they do the work for you, but I mean, they, let's look at Habitat for Humanity, for example, which Desiree used to work for. Um, they have people all over the world helping them build houses, people with no construction experience. I mean, that's not the most efficient way to build that house, but that's not important. The important thing is it's building that engagement, making that relationship, and, and making long-term supporters of your nonprofit. So 
even if you feel like, gosh, trying to get someone for a five-minute thing just to like make a petition or you know, do something really quick for us, that's not worth it. It is, because you can start to engage them long-term, as long as you have a plan and a way to do that. Next slide, please. So here's an example of a compelling online volunteer job description. You want to make it fun, make it simple and specific, make it manageable and achievable, and just give constant cheery feedback. So let's say you want someone to design your annual report for you. So you could say, would you like to have a serious impact on our cause? Help us design and write the best annual report ever. Use your mad design skills to help our nonprofit look its best. So you can see here there's an annual report from Indianapolis Museum of Art. I'm a museum. And it's got uh, Ai Weiwei with his uh, vase on it. So that looks really beautiful, really professional. Uh, maybe you could show some examples to the uh, volunteer and say, we want something that looks like this. Next slide, please. You also need to make it fun. So if you know that volunteers are interested in design and you want not just design, but someone who's enjoying themselves, say, create fun infographics. Uh, design our annual report, do some spell checking, and then research our brand and competitor brands. So you could ask them to look at everything that's on your website and some of your collateral materials, and then look at, OK, who's nationally doing what we're doing, or who's regionally doing what we're doing, and if, are they doing it better? How can we differentiate ourselves from them? And that's really helpful for uh, a virtual volunteer to do as well. If they're designing a report for you, you want to make sure it looks different than everyone else's. Uh, next slide, please. Great. And then you want to make it exclusive. Maybe the qualifications are previous design experience, and you want to have a, a year, like maybe three design experience, uh, excellent oral and written communication skills, type at least 40 words a minute, maybe experience of print design. Maybe you want to print it and put it online. And then the deadline. The deadline makes it urgent for people. So last day to apply, December 20th, 2014. Maybe you're wanting to get this out in January 2015. So that would be a way to just make sure people know that this is not just an open-ended thing. Next slide, please. If you want more resources on uh, job descriptions, how to manage online virtual volunteers, check out uh, the latest edition of the last virtual volunteering guidebook. Uh, Sherry Ilson already reported on this in the Volunteer Match blog back in February, but just in case you didn't see that, um, it's excellent. And uh, if you just Google the last virtual volunteering guidebook, you can find it. Uh, it's really good. And she also wrote it with uh, Susan Ellis. And she, she worked in it for about eight years, I think. So it's, it's really comprehensive. So that's one of the resources that I would highly recommend for you after this webinar today. Uh, next slide, please. Now we're going to switch gears the role for Dollars for Doers programs, and the best ways to use them. So Dollars for Doers, that's simply um, an employee volunteers with you, and you get a certain number of dollars per hour per person for the people that volunteer with you. That's the long and the short of it. So um, EVPs, or Employee Volunteerism Programs, allow you to collect $10 per person or more. Um, and these uh, first five give you $10 an hour per person. So Old Navy, Kohl's, Starbucks, Best Buy, and Macy's. And the best way to start building that relationship is to just walk in and say, hey, um, I'm interested in learning more about your employee volunteerism program. Who should I chat with? And they might say, oh, the store manager. Just go into your local store. And then they can give you more instructions about what to do from there. Uh, the next few that I'm going to show you on the next slide, um, Coinstar, and then um, ExxonMobil, ConocoPhillips, Verizon, Aetna, Microsoft, Dell, Real Networks, Time Warner. Oh, Real Networks, I said it again, sorry. Um, these are actually, they'll give you $15 an hour per person. And so, um, for example, when I was working at a small domestic violence nonprofit, we had 10 Starbucks volunteers come and uh, volunteer with us for our gala. And they all paid, uh, the, the company paid $10 an hour per person, and we got you know, about $5,000 for having people come and be with us. So it was like a whole sponsorship just to have these people come and help us at our event. It really worked. It was really powerful, and we built relationships with those people. Unfortunately, um, because I was so green, I didn't really follow up with them after the uh, gala, and I wish I had. I really wish I had done more to engage and motivate these Starbucks volunteers to be more involved with us long term. As Amanda said earlier, one of the things that their company likes to do is 
do educational things that are related to people's jobs. And so you might want to consider some of the nonprofit, some, some of the corporations you see listed here. Does your nonprofit do anything that they could help you with? Are you a, a nonprofit that works on technology, for example? Maybe some Microsoft or Dell employees could come and uh, tutor some people uh, or some program participants at your nonprofit. Maybe you get loaned executives from Verizon, something like that. So, so there's some things to think about. Uh, next slide. So when you're thinking about who to reach out to, think about what companies are physically closest to you. So even if it's virtual, this matters. A lot of times when you look in, let's say, the Grant Space Foundation Center database, you'll see that corporations don't necessarily want to support anyone who's not in the area where they have operations because they want to have their volunteers involved with you. That's part of what makes it worth it for them. So just look around you in your like local area, in your, in your city, in your county, or in your province. Um, that's really important. Next slide. So what are you offering in exchange for the company's help? So if you want them to come in and make food for your Meals and Wheels program, for example, that's fabulous. What can you offer them? Can you offer them a photo opportunity for their annual report like these people had here from Bank of America? Um, can you offer them uh, a chance to get involved long term? You know, how else can you plug these people into your programs or you know, how can you continue to get their involvement? So also, um, maybe you want to uh, feature them in your annual report. Maybe they'd like that too. Or perhaps the, you'll get a newspaper to come and write an article about the good job that they're doing in your community. That would really motivate them to come back again next year. Next slide. What type of help do you need? Just start there. You know, think about everything you need. Just sit down with program people and say, okay, we need this, 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 and this. Next slide. How flexible are you about scheduling? You know, these corporations, they have a lot of very, very busy people. If they can't come one month, can they come the next month? You know, that's okay. Don't penalize them for not showing up. Just allow them to just be grateful for what they, they can give to you. Next slide. So what resources above and beyond people are you hoping to get? So if they're showing up and they don't have any aprons to make the food for you, well, that's not good. If you expect them to bring the aprons, you should have said that. So you need to make sure there's enough aprons for everyone, for example. If they're painting a fence, you need to make sure that the brushes and paint are there, unless you're expecting them to bring that for them. Again, it, it just you need to make clear exactly what they need to do to be successful in a volunteer role. Next slide. So if you use Global Giving, what they have, and you can see the different kinds of things they do with corporations there. They have an e-gift card program, and HP uses it to recognize global employee volunteers and it's a low-cost alternative to a fully globalized Dollars for Doers program. That's what they do. Um, but if you want to get more hands-on stuff, you can have a typical painting project or park cleanup or construction project, as an example. Uh, next slide. You can also use events uh, as a way to start building these relationships. But as you heard from Amanda, events aren't really a long-term kind of partnership. It can just be a one-off thing. If you want to keep building that relationship, make sure that you have emails and um, things you can send to follow up with everybody who came to volunteer at your event, whether it's a gala or golf event or a walkathon. Um, this is an example from Microsoft that helped out with Chicago Care Service on. Uh, think about how you can follow people consistently to make sure that they know that you're interested in engaging with them long term. So there's lots of little pieces of that, but the end result should be that Maybe you can get a board member. Maybe you can get people to come in and do an educational piece for your team or for your, your program uh, participants. So just think about that. Uh, next slide, please. Wonderful. So if you want more resources and examples of how to use Dollars for Doers programs or how to engage corporations in a win-win kind of situation, check out Win-Win for the Greater Good by Bruce Birch. He is the granddaddy of cause marketing. He has um, done this for a very, very long time. I think he got the first cause marketing partnership in 1973, I want to say. Um, but here's some other examples. Uh, you might want to try financial education volunteers from financial services companies like Amanda's company. A uh, pet food company may be volunteering with an animal shelter or loaned executives from any kind of company for your nonprofit board. So uh, next slide, please. That's it. Uh, looking forward to um, connecting with you in the Q&A afterwards. And thank you so much. If you have any questions, it's my number, it's my email. 
and I'd be happy to chat with you. Thank you, Madam Grant. Those were such detailed um, introductions to two really important and valuable ways to deepen em engagement of corporate employees in nonprofit volunteering. Um, and I know that we've got a bunch of great questions that we will bring in at the end. It looks like we're going to have plenty of time. Uh, but for now, we want to move on to the next section of the session about outside-the-box program elements. And for this section, I think, Desiree, you're going to get us started. So um, take it away. Yeah. Thanks. Um, if you can, I'm Desiree Attaway of the Attaway Group, and I'm happy to be here. was really excited to talk about partnerships um, when we did this last year, and again, happy to continue to have that discussion and really think about how corporations and nonprofits can partner and really utilize skilled um, volunteers and global volunteerism in a really um, impactful way for, for all concerned. So next slide, please. So yeah, so with any volunteers that you have, um, it really is about what is the value add for both sides, right? I want to make it a great experience for the, for the corporation, but I also want to make it a great experience for the nonprofit, and especially if you are internationally for the folks on the ground. And you want to utilize volunteers with specific skills and certification um, in a way that will give you more bang for your buck, buck and you can really leverage, um, leverage that tool to help build capacity. So one of the things you want to think about is to be thoughtful about what your organization really needs and intentional in setting expectation around that. Um, you want to make sure, like Mazarin and Amanda had, clear job descriptions, clear scope of project, understanding um, the needs um, and actually being able to have really difficult conversations with each other, real honest conversations about what is it going to be like on the ground for um, folks who are, who are providing the service and the skill. Um, because ultimately you want to make sure that, again, every volunteer leaves satisfied. This is relationship building. And you as the nonprofit want to have a very clear path to take a volunteer coming through your doors. And as a corporation, you also want to have a very clear path about what you want your volunteers and your employees to be doing. And again, how is this helping you build your brand, build your awareness, and increasing your, um, um, your connection and your relationship with communities? So you want to identify businesses in your local area that employ the talent that you have. And you want to make sure that there's a real good match between your culture and your organization of skilled volunteers. That takes a while to get there. And that could be testing and doing um, a lot of little projects first before you get to some of the bigger ones. And before I leave, I'll talk about some kind of best practices in this area. One um, example I want to talk about, though, is Whirlpool Corporation has partnered with Habitat for Humanity for years and years and years, and it's probably one of their largest, if not their, the largest partner that they have. I do not work for Habitat anymore, but for years I have worked for them. And uh, when I left, I was their senior director of volunteer mobilization. And being uh, there, I saw their relationship with the Whirlpool Corporation evolve over the years. And so some of you guys may know that in the U.S., um, every Habitat house built in the U.S. has a Whirlpool stove and refrigerator, which is amazing, right? But over the years, that relationship has grown deeper and evolved. And by the time I left Habitat, Whirlpool had committed to touching every Habitat home built around the world. And they did that by either product, people, or money. So they made sure that any Habitat house that was being built, they were going to touch in some way, whether that was with skilled workers, whether that was with unskilled volunteers, whether that was an actual pro product um, donation, or whether that was just a cash donation uh, towards each home build. So again, that took a lot of years to get to, a lot of relationships, a lot of really understanding Whirlpool's corporation needs, where they were going strategically, and how that could, um, how they could build a really great relationship and use their employees well. So whether that was for a five-minute um, opportunity or a 20-minute or a 10-day one, how can we use these volunteers well? Next slide. So 
you know, one of the great things about uh, these international corporate volunteering opportunities is there's some really great ones happening out there. So um, new data is showing that the international corporate volunteer program, like those run by IBM or PepsiCo or Intel, really get high marks inside their companies. And best practice, you know, now people are really digging in deeper and saying, okay, let's make sure that it's impact the development and whether it's scaling fast enough um, and whether it's doing the job on the ground is really happening. But um, if you were to kind of think of it like a Yelp review, most of these corporations um, are getting some really great reviews and um, are really seeing the internal building of these global-minded leaders as essential to their business survival. And corporate volunteerism, international corporate volunteerism, is one strategy for a lot of corporations to do that. Last time we spoke, I always talked about partnerships being transformational and not just transactional. And especially in this realm, that really counts. You want to make sure every relationship that is happening is transformational for the communities involved, for the volunteers involved, and not just transactional, not just you giving or taking, but really about building something that can be lasting. So Brookings did a great report, and um, I want to highlight just a few of the great um, opportunities that, and talk about some of the ways that corporate folks are doing international programming. So, you know, IBM has their on-demand community, which is a fairly sophisticated, multi-country, local service model that brings employees from, I don't know, about 140 IBM um, technology asset departments, brings their resources, their strategies, their programs, tutorials to communities around the world that would not have access to that level of experience. And, um, and it helped, and they've been tracking their volunteer efforts. I think they've had more than 80,000 volunteers um, whose work had represented over 4.4 million hours of service, which of course leverages a significant amount of IBM assets and skills, um, while at the same time showing IBM's technology solutions around the world. Again, a win-win for all concerned. Another interesting um, kind of um, sample of a, a international corporate volunteer program is Starbucks. And so they've evolved a, a, an evolution of a volunteerism program that places employees in, in environmental projects globally, most places where they're growing uh, and getting product for coffee from. And Starbucks worked with Earthwatch Institute to really create a socially conscious customer base and um, experience. So. They took 10 employees and 20 customers um, and participated together in a program on a coffee farm, um, I do believe in Costa Rica. And it really offered everyone an opportunity to witness the impact of the company at different levels in that supply chain and to bring their skills to that local community. Another great one is the Timberland Company. Um, the company has a program called Path of Service, which provides all full-time employees with 40 hours of paid time to volunteer in a range of social sectors, right? So they have some targeted uh, programs in Asia where the company maintains several of their business alliances and business partnerships. And they work with local NGOs, green networks, and other programs to help mobilize their employees, their customers, and their business partners as well. They don't just talk about their employees, but they bring in their vendors and their business partners to help be a part of um, opportunities. So they did a big um, tree planting opportunity in northern China and Mongolia um, and because they had, a, they had an effort. They would, they would plant one million trees in the region prior to the Beijing Olympics. Another great um, way that I've seen um, some of these uh, really good opportunities work so that companies are leveraging what they're doing is Bain. Bain is a consulting company. And um, I don't know if they still do this, but they used to offer to their new recruits when they were hitting the um, graduate school circuit hiring that um, if you signed with Bain, one of the perks you got was that you could go on a Habitat trip 
a global village trip, an international building trip. So you could um, say, yeah, I want to go to Cambodia and build. I actually led a trip, a volunteer trip to Cambodia where I had two Bain employees join that trip. Bain paid for the cost for them to volunteer as well as the air flight for them to go over and volunteer. And they both spoke highly and said to me that was one of the perks and one of the reasons that they chose Bain over other opportunities that, um, that was before them. Okay. Um, next slide. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about what are some of the real key um, pieces um, around best practices and recommendations. One is you want to set goals before your roles. You want to identify the business motivation for volunteering and really developing programs to fit those goals. You want to walk before you run. You want to do a lot of testing. Um, determine which of the you know operational models you want to pursue. Do you want to do cross-border service or local service? Um, you want to make sure that you do opportunities that create social impact. Well, uh, that will bring um, greater companies leverage their employees and workplace skills and knowledge. Um, you want to make sure that you align with their, with their philanthropic and their social um, corporate social responsibility activities. Right. You want to make sure that your, their values are in alignment with yours and that their strategies are in alignment with yours. And you want to partner proactively. Partnerships provide access to resources a company may not have. So you want to think about not just partnering with them, but who are their vendors and who are their business partners. You want to invest in infrastructure. Right? Ensure that you have adequate internal resources to manage volunteering programs from the part of corporate side as well as from the um, nonprofit side. And you want to have lots of clear communication. Be upfront about the motivations, the benefits, and the challenges. And make sure you do really great messaging internally and externally. And I wanted to just take a couple of minutes before we go into questions to talk about what does it mean to volunteer during disaster. Um, I was working with Habitat when the Haiti earthquake happened. And we literally had a week to mobilize resources to create I do believe the first round we created um, 6,000 kits that were then sent to families in Haiti. And we used partners like Whirlpool to use, um, to use they donated a huge um, space that we could bring in. Delta gave us hundreds of volunteers every day to come in and help put these kits together. Literally in less than a week, we mobilized um, over a thousand volunteers to create over eight thousand kits in four days. We brought in the U.S. government. We used AmeriCorps members um, to help um, do some of this organizing, and we literally tapped in every corporate partnership and person we can think of, um, an organization that we knew had an affinity and cared about what was happening in Haiti, um, to help us do this. And we used um, some of Delta's logistic support to help us work with getting these kids in and through immigration and making it to, uh, to where they really belong and could do the most work. So um, a lot of people always want to volunteer during times of disaster. And I just wanted to make sure that if you're a corporation uh, or an individual who want to do um, long-term work uh, and help in, in areas of disaster, um, do not travel to any affected area without um, working with, in partnership with someone local on the ground. Uh, folks that just show up or corporations or businesses that just show up are usually referred to as spontaneous unaffiliated volunteers or SUVs. And while having a big heart is all outdoors is amazing, SUVs can be difficult if not impossible to involve in operations. One great way that your business can support um, folks on the ground during times of disaster is to give some of your corporate folks. Donate some of your VPs to help think through strategy and building and logistics. The things that folks on the ground, that relief workers need most is really kind of some of that long-term um, thinking through about how do you rebuild. And so um, sometimes giving up your great 
and your brightest and your best minds for six months or a year is really the best thing you can do to help as a corporation in times of disaster. Um, happy to answer any questions anybody may have. And you can always reach me at Desiree at DesireeAdway.com. Thank you, Desiree. That was wonderful. And I actually, I have a follow-up question. Um, <laughs> I, I'm just so um, fascinated by um, hearing about uh, the work that you did um, with Habitat for Haiti Relief. And uh, at Volunteer Match, we try and encourage folks to um, volunteer beforehand in terms of disaster preparedness. Um, we don't, um, and then we get people involved, and as you said, we try and discharge the spontaneous or unaffiliated volunteering. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious, what do you think were the key factors in your success in terms of organizing so many great corporate partners to help you in your relief efforts at that time? It was because we'd had deep relationships with them before. You know, it's just like an ask of an individual donor. If you don't communicate with people, you can't just show up all of a sudden and ask for something. So we, were, we had great partnerships with them already. And so when we called and said, um, we need somebody to help us build, a, you know, kind of really build um, uh, some software and a database so that we can capture what needs to happen here in the next couple of days, they said, yeah, here are two people um, that we're happy to help you do that. And, you know, we were able to reach out to Delta and say, we need volunteers. And literally, Delta volunteers flew from all over the world, right, because they can jump on flights for free. So we would look up, and there would be people who were like, oh, yeah, we, we came from California, or we flew in from New York this morning because we wanted to come and help build these kits. And so it's, it's really having those relationships and those partnerships in place prior to needing them. That's what it means to talk about trans transformational work as opposed to transactional work. Great. Thank you, Desiree. Um, Amanda and Mazarin, do you actually, do either of you have any thoughts or perspectives about disaster relief and disaster preparedness volunteering in the context of uh, corporate nonprofit partnerships? Oh, Desiree, could you mute yourself? Um, I think you've got some background noise there. I uh, sure can, so that's that. Yeah, thanks. Um, I actually, I've never done disaster relief, and I have no clue. Amanda? <laughs> We, we don't have a formal program where we mobilize our employees for disaster relief, um, but we do see both with disasters and also with international volunteering, because I know that was a big topic Desiree talked on um, or spoke to. We have seen our employees use their vacation time um, to become a part of a program that already exists um, to, to provide disaster relief. Um, we've also seen employees use their sabbaticals to volunteer internationally. Um, and that's been something that, while it's not organized by our company, um, you know, individuals have certainly used the time off that the company gives them um, and channeled it in a way that, you know, they're able to, to give their time internationally um, and to support, um, you know, in some cases relief efforts, but more common what I've seen has been um, planned kind of ongoing um, opportunities with international volunteering. And actually right now we have a team in Kenya that just organized themselves and um, got together to volunteer and um, strengthen um, education for girls in Kenya at a local school. So um, we see a lot of grassroots efforts happening. And again, it's based on relationships. So an organization um, sharing their mission, connecting with one employee, and then that employee you know, doing the work and recruiting others. So I think relationships really do go a long way. Great, thank you. So um, we're going to move into the more general Q&A portion now. Um, there have been a bunch of questions that have come through about how do I research potential partners, how do I reach out to potential partners and initially establish a partnership. And I'm going to quickly answer that one in the interest of time so that we can stay with the focus of this part two webinar session. In part one, uh, of this corporate nonprofit partnerships webinar, we went through a lot of strategies that have to do with finding and building partnerships. So I urge you folks, if you're wondering about those sort of more basic steps, to go to the Volunteer Match YouTube channel and the Volunteer Match SlideShare account and look up 
be part one of this session. And we will also send those links out with the links for this part two session in the follow-up email that we're sending to everyone. So you will have access to all of that information all at once, I promise. But for now, I'd really like to stick with the idea of deepening partnerships, out-of-the-box program elements, engaging volunteers beyond events, and all of that. So um, let's see. Oh, here's a really easy one, actually. Um, Mazarin, is Dollars for Doers the official name of those programs? If someone was going to approach a partner about Dollars for Doers, can they call it that, or should they call it something else? That's a good question. Um, I'd, I'd first maybe talk to the HR professional that you can reach at this nonprofit, uh, sorry, at this corporation, and say, uh, who is in charge of employee engagement? And then maybe just start the conversation there. And then say, uh, oh, this person is. You talk to them and say, hey, do you have a Dollars for Doers program or do you have like an EDP program? And, um, and if they know what that means, great. And if they don't, you can explain it to them. I, I, I wouldn't assume that they know what it means. Um, and usually you can find out if there is one by going to the, uh, to the Foundation Center slash grant space uh, database in your local community. Um, you can often do some in preliminary research there that will save you time later. Great, thank you. And this is a quick one for Amanda. Um, a whole bunch of people, not surprisingly, are really interested in the programs you mentioned from Schwab and how nonprofits, um, especially on a more local level, might be able to get involved in some of those programs with their local Schwab branches. So if a nonprofit wants to look into that, how can they do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, um, I think it was mentioned earlier, you know, if there's a location near you, a Schwab location, I think that's a great starting point in terms of um, building a relationship. Um, we have 300 branches across the country, so um, there's a good chance there might be one in your neighborhood. And each of them kind of choose to engage with different organizations and causes in the community, um, depending on, you know, um, just uh, interests and um, what's available to them. But they're always really open. You know, the doors are always open on our branches if you um, have ideas you'd like to share. Um, you can also reach us at the Charles Schwab Foundation at schwab.com with any questions that you have um, in terms of, you know, a specific volunteer opportunity or, or other things you'd like to learn. We're always um, open to answering those inquiries as well. Great, thank you. So this question has come through a few times, and I think it's actually a really good one because it does, it is relevant for some of the other things that we talked about today, such as skilled volunteering and virtual volunteering. There are many organizations um, and causes that don't require direct service work, uh, advocacy groups and, and other groups that they don't necessarily have a way to engage volunteers on the ground, so to speak. So this question is really for all three of you, whoever has some ideas. How can um, organizations and companies on both sides of the aisle engage volunteers with these types of causes? What are some strategies for building partnerships around that? This is Desiree. Um, I, I take a shot at this. I think that um, you can think about it not just being a one-off experience or something that you do. So I think I always take a volunteer experience and um, I saw that what Amanda had for Schwab and I've always used that is every experience with anyone should be about education. It should be about some form of activation and then it should be about advocacy. So. Every opportunity that you're taking to educate someone about your cause and the importance of it um, is one level. The second piece there is activation does not always look like building of a house. Sometimes activation is actually building a, an, an experience where you dig deeper into the education of the issues around that cause and then use that as a leverage tool then to help take a, um, an individual or a corporation deeper into your work. So, you know, when I worked for Habitat, it was easy because people are like, oh, you go and you build that house. Well, it's more than just building that house. It is 
you know, there's a billion people globally in need of safe, decent shelter. You can build houses, but you can never build enough. So really, how do we talk then about taking those experiences and taking people maybe into a country or into a community where you don't do anything, but it's really about teaching them the importance. So again, maybe you go to the DR with a group of folks and you never once build, but what you do is you dig into what does it mean to actually own property here and what's the process and you really talk about how owning and getting anything titled in the DR can take up to seven, eight, nine, ten years and so really how do we change laws, how do we change systems to make access fair. So I think there, there's some um, creative things you can do around it when you don't actually have that, um, that big thing that you do that people are engaged in but to think of education and awareness as the doing. I would add also from you know, the corporate perspective, um, first of all, most organizations have board members, so those are volunteer positions. So you, you know, I think most organizations do have those. Um, but in terms of creating larger um, you know, means for folks to get involved, um, I think we've seen here you know, employees host um, brown bag lunches where they come in and have a nonprofit, you know, present a cause that they care about just to educate folks, as Desiree said, about the cause, about getting involved in some way that um, connects them to it. We've also seen employees lead fundraising campaigns, um, so getting their um, coworkers involved in um, getting behind a cause and raising funds for that, and, and to me that's volunteering as well. But I think just having an engagement piece is important because it gives um, the opportunity for that employer or individual to get to know your organization better. Um, so it doesn't have to be a volunteer event, but um, you know, if there's an action for them to take, I think that's where um, you know, they feel like their contribution is valuable and they can get to learn more about your cause. Thank you both. I think that was really valuable insight. Um, we're going to have to close out in a couple minutes, so um, sort of to honor this special part two session, um, if, oh, hold on, siren passing. All right, I'm just going to talk over it. So um, if this, either any of the three of you have sort of a final thought about corporate nonprofit partnerships that everyone should walk away with today, just one quick sound bite from each of the three of you. So Mazarin, do you have one really quick nugget you want to make sure everyone takes home with them? I would say yes. Um, I would like to echo the wonderful thing that Desiree Attaway said about making sure that the volunteer partnership is a win for the corporation and it's a win for you. So don't just try to make something we will do, but actually make, hopefully, have an impact on your organization and then go deeper, design the experience, um, and be back and forth a lot with the corporation to make sure that you know what makes a win for them so that you can ha make sure that everyone is satisfied at the end. Great. Thank you. Desiree, you're next. Desiree, are you still there? Yeah, I was muted. I'm sorry. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Oops, I'm just talking. Um, I would just say, um, really, um, as, a, as a corporate side of it, use this opportunity to really build capacity and leadership within your, within your organization, um, as well as for the nonprofit. Use these opportunities to help build capacity, professional development, and leadership within your organizations. Perfect. Thank you. And Amanda? I would just encourage you all to take that first step and start small. Start with one employee. Start with um, engaging that one person to uh, make the ask, take that next step. And I think, you know, I hope what you've learned from today is that that can really result in a uh, broad and deep partnership and relationship. Great. Thank you. So everyone, thank you for joining us today. As a reminder, we will be sending out the slide deck and the um, YouTube recording, as well as a whole bunch of other resources for you from our speakers and from Volunteer Match. Um, the email may take a little while to get to you, but it will get to you. It's summer, so things go more slowly around here. I don't know about you folks. 
but we are so excited about the content from this webinar. We want to share it. We want you to share it. Desiree, Amanda, and Mazarin, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you folks on the line are curious about other webinars from Volunteer Match, check out learn.volunteermatch.org. Next month's webinar is another special joint session with our Corporate Best Practice Network webinar uh, series, and that one is all about um, reimagining and reframing the value of volunteer service from both the corporate and nonprofit perspective. So we're going to be challenging the status quo a little bit. And you can see that webinar uh, information uh, in the Learning Center at learn.volunteermatch.org. And that's it. We're out of time. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, huge thank you to our three wonderful speakers. And we hope to see you again soon on a webinar from Volunteer Match. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. you.